Hello, everyone. Welcome to Chapter Three: Name, Scope, Binding, and Environment. Objective: Definition of name, binding, scope, and environment. Binding: Allocation of memory, memory model, scope rules, and the reference environment. So let's look at this. Uh, we talk about the type and the type system uh, in the previous lecture. So now let's look at it. We have a variable. So we have an A equals three and A is a variable, okay? So when we assign three to it, basically you need to have certain memory location. So let's assume that this memory address is A254, okay? So A254 binding with A, this is called binding. Okay, A is the name, name of the variable. And the A is binding with this. This actually is called binding. Okay, and three is a value. So we put three into here. <clears throat> this is a simple variable and the binding. Okay, and binding is the allocation of the memory, allocation of the memory. But you may have a A, in here, and you may call a f function, and inside your f function, there may be different definition for a. So a here and here may means different memory allocation. So that can be bind to different location, and then the lifetime of the binding we call it scope. We call it scope. So scope is where you can see your available. Let's go scoping. So here we will touch the binding scoping. And the last one is the reference environment. Reference environment means all of the binding that you can see right now is called the environment. So that's whenever you go into certain function, we need to talk about the current reference environment. So this chapter, will be focused on the memory, variable, binding, scope, and environment. So basically, it is the whole system to determine which variable you are accessing and where it is. So we call it the name, binding, scope, and environment. And you can look at it as the uh, variables binding with the memory locations. Okay, we have many talking about this. Okay, so what about name, binding, and scope? A name is exactly what you think it is. It's the name, it's an ID. So an ID can be a variable name, can be a function name, and function can also be an object. So basically, name is uh, actually talking about which object you are associated with, okay? So symbol like plus can also be a name. You can think about it as the name of the operator. So binding is associated, it's an association with two things. It is the name and the, the thing that you name. We can call this one object, okay? We call this one object. And if you are primitive variable, it is the memory location we are talking about. If you are the object, you are talking about the object you associate with in the heap. Okay, so these are binding. And then the scope of the binding is the part of program in which the binding is active. So we talk about it as the lifetime of the binding. We call it scope. Okay. Next one, binding time is the point at which a binding is created and general, more generally, the point at which any implementation decision is made. So binding time, it depends on the language, okay? It can be at language design time. So language design time, we define what? Sometimes we define some variables such as pi or zero, you have fixed location. That's when you define language, it already been there, that's called language design time. 
Sometimes it's language implementation time. So basically it's IO arithmetic overflow or time equivalence, the jump to certain interrupt. You actually is designed at the implementation time of your language. Okay. And then we may have static binding and the dynamic binding. And static binding is the binding that you form it at compilation time. Okay, so basically, usually the static binding also as associated with static uh, scoping. So you actually sometimes also have the, uh, the, the so-called type, uh, static typing. So you declare the type, you allocate the memory, you actually associate the memory with the name, and it is decided at the, the compile time. We call it early binding or static binding. Dynamic typing, on the other hand, actually will be, the, the, the association will be formed at the wrong time. We call it the dynamic binding. And typical dynamic binding language are the JavaScript and the uh, a Python, this kind of the type, type list or, or hidden type language, the weak type language. And uh, usually they are dynamic binding, okay? So some language like C++, it provides static binding and dynamic binding, okay? And static binding is the standard way that C++ do. And dynamic binding is at the wrong time, they have a virtual function, and they will be bind to different locations. And some language like uh, Java, it has the dynamic binding all the time. So you have to check your member method and it always been by at the wrong time. That's called dynamic binding. So each type of binding has its own advantage and disadvantage. So at this moment, what you need to learn is what is the binding time that for your language. For Python, it's late binding, dynamic binding. Okay, and we may have parametric binding. Okay, some language that actually pass the actual parameter to a subroutine and subroutine wrong it and then uh, bind your variable with the formal parameter. Okay, that's parametric binding. And parametric binding for some language like JavaScript, it can be type list. So, so the, uh, the long time, it will determine the type. Okay, so binding is associated with the object location. Also, sometimes will be associated with type definition. That's called parametric binding. On the right-hand side, we have polymorphic method binding. The example is in Java. Okay, it's in Java. So we can declare a object that's called P, an object is actually color the point. Okay. So color the point is actually a class and it inherits a point. And point inherited the object class. Okay. So right here we declare a object called color the uh, point. It has a value of 10, 20, and color red. Okay. So this point is an object. It's an object of the color uh, point. And the X, Y are window fields, so you have a value. And then the color, the color object you assign with the object color that red for it, okay? And then there are some functions that you have get color and you have get X. So get color, you will look at your uh, class definition. So there's a get color definition so you will, at the wrong time, your wrong is it's, uh, the function that defined in the class. But when you do get x, get x, the color point do not have the, it does not have the definition. So you will go back to its parent class and its parent class have definition. So your wrong is get x version over here. So if the point also don't have the get x, then you go back to its uh, grandparents' definition. Okay, so this one is called dynamic binding. At the wrong time, you uh, uh, go through your inheritance tree, uh, going from your closest definition point to get the function definition. If you don't get it, they will search up to your parent class 
or grandparent class to find the definition of the function. So right here, this is chart. This chart we show you in the chap uh, chapter two already is the strong type, weak type, and uh, static typing and dynamic binding the four quadrant of the different languages. Python is static scope by dynamic binding. So dynamic binding means that the association of the uh, of the variable is dynamically bind when the wrong time it bind it. But scoping is uh, actually steady scope. That means that when you write down the program where it is, it is global, it will be global. It's local, it will be local. Okay, so the scope where you can see the variable is actually scope. It actually is uh, determined at your uh, compile time or interpretation time. Okay, but the binding, okay, the binding where you bind the variable to some location, it actually is uh, wrong time. Wrong time you have the binding. Okay, so this one is actually not easy to see over here. Okay, this only some definition. We will have to check some example to understand what does this mean for statically scope and the dynamic binding. Okay, uh, static scoping actually is determined of the binding uh, lifetime of the binding, and dynamic scoping is very difficult to to uh, understand. So statical scoping is easier to understand. Uh, but but because it's a scripting language, so it uses dynamic binding. We'll talk about this uh, later. So scope, the scope of the Python is static. It's the same as C++. The difference between these two languages is related to the rule of that defines start and ending of the name. Okay. In C++, variable I is considered to be global. Okay. Before declaring local definition, integer i equals 15. Uh, right here, what we want to know is like Python is a language, pure object oriented programming language, and it's scripting language, it, and it's run on top of C and C. So a lot of rule actually is following C, except for the object oriented rule. So, and the scripting rule. So a lot of things. Actually, borrow from C double plus. Dynamic binding. Binding in Python is the process of giving an object a name. For instance, this, this string equals hello world, and that is the binding, dynamic uh, binding. Okay. You're binding the name string to a string object with the hello world. And in Python, this happened at the wrong time. And dynamic binding is when it happens. Uh, based on users deep input and other data. Okay, anyway, this one's still very hard to understand. Let's look at example. So let's look at binding number one. Let's assume we have the variable a, okay, equals three, and we define a function f a equals uh, 10. So let's print a, Okay, and that's actually over here, that's also pulling A. And to differentiate them, here we actually say A in F, okay. And this one, let's call it global A. Okay. So basically over here, you define a variable three, the a equals three and then you print it. Okay. And here actually, let's see, let's actually uh, clear it. So before we run that, we let's run the f function as well. So let's run this one. Okay, let's run this one. So the answer is a is a local variable. Okay. And then, and then this a outside is a global variable. So what happened is that your main function has its own environment, and a is three. So you when you call f, f have a friend, okay, f have a friend. It has another a in the assign which ten. 
So main function, the your global power is here. You have a equals three, and then and then here you have ten. Okay, here over ten. So these are actually different binding. But if you want to have this A variable to be the same as this one, <clears throat> we can call it global. So global A, we say our A is a global A. In this case, in this case, okay, that's wrong here, okay. In this case, it's the same A, so your, your global A being updated as well, okay? Your, your global A being updated as well. So here, if I don't have this local A, and I just print this A over here, and this case is actually 3, 3, because you cannot find this A in here, and you will use the global A. So there's a scoping rule you need to remember is the BGL. Okay, I'm sorry, BGEL. So B is the built in by the library. Okay, global is my definition. Local is the A in the F function. So remember it's BGEL. Okay. So that's scoping rule. If you, this one, we call it local. And this one is actually, we call it global. Okay, so here we have another one, this one's local. So here, if we have another one, we have uh, if, okay, uh, two, okay, we just use a assumption, I uh, always have an A equals 100, and point A, A in uh, Cobra. Okay, and then we actually call this A. And after that, we actually, uh, let's do this one, let's actually call this one, copy and paste. Okay, and here that's actually uh, second one, okay. Okay, so let's do this one, okay. So this one now, the local variable cannot be seen because we redefine it for the local. Uh, let's actually put a global A. Okay, global A. Okay, so when we call global A, uh, this 100 actually is, the enclosed value is 100. Okay, enclosed value is 100. And it actually updating the global one as well. Uh, this A actually has no definition because we have local definition here. So if you want to do local, you do have need to declare this one. Otherwise, you do need to declare it as global. Okay. Otherwise, this A has no definition because later in the sum of the COBRA, you define it, okay? So this is some uh, detailed things in Python. Anyway, let's move on, okay? That actually is some scoping rule. It's very complicated in Python, okay? Next one, we actually look into the namespace, okay? So namespace is in each, in each location, uh, you have the scoping rule. So you have LEGB rule, okay? We're going from button local, enclosed, global, and built in, okay? So then space, uh, each functional level, each loop level, you will have its own uh, namespace, okay? And uh, that's the purpose of function, okay? And there's a global namespace, a local namespace, and each module also have its own namespace. So we need to deal with the namespace very carefully, okay? And the program step is also very important. So let's look at this naming problem, okay? Scoping. So let's assume that we have the sum, okay? 
So here as a swing that we a equals three, okay, b equals four, okay. So we define a function for sum, okay. Let's assume that we don't define a sum, so we do use a sum of, so that's h two put a t equals a and b, so that's h calculate sum. Okay, so here we do calculate sum with the tuple, okay. So this one would get seven, okay? If the sum is a BOE function, that we get. Okay, so now this one, it gets in the sum, but somehow if locally we define another sum function, okay? I uh, take in another value, okay? Let's try uh, TT, okay, TT. And this one we actually will return, okay? TT of the one minus TT of the zero. So by doing this, we actually create a new definition for the sum, okay? And this sum actually will be using the local definition. So in this case, it's only one. So be careful if you want to use the built-in sum function, do not replace this one by this, okay? Do not replace it. And in this case, this one, we no longer have it, okay? So here, you want to run the sum, you need to do pi sum, build in of okay, the sum, okay? So let's import build in S, okay? Okay, this time it work, okay, it's not it work. Build in is a module, okay? So if you redefine it, you will override it. So this one must be very careful, okay? If you really override your built-in functions, if you really override your built-in function, you may lose it. So you better check if you do have the built-in function that you can use. This standard built-in function, I think sometimes it's very easy that you override such well, such function as this one, str, set, map, uh, max, minimum, next. This view function name actually very easy to override, okay? Because I think those words are very common, okay? Even complex is also very easy to override. So be careful here, okay? I just try to show you the, the, the so-called uh, module. And you can also put it as a simpler name, okay? Uh, okay, such as this, okay? such as this. So it's up to you to decide it how you want to call it, okay, to avoid the map. But remember that if you have local definition, you may override your uh, built-in. So this one is what? This one is uh, here. Locally, you have a sub definition. So you have your module, a namespace that has a sum. Build-in also have a sum. So you import your build-in, then you want to run it, you have to put the build-in as that sum in order to call this one, okay. And if you want to merge the, the, the whole uh, namespace, then don't do this, okay. If you want to merge the namespace, you do from build-in as Okay, import star. Okay, in this case, we run this one. Okay, we run this one. We merge the namespace, okay? We run this one and you still get one because you are not overriding uh, this one, okay? But you, if we don't have it, if we don't have this uh, function, okay? Then you will get, uh, the, the, uh, the so-called uh, local definition of the sum. So basically, so from built-in in post star actually is useless because default you already import your built-in, okay? Default you already import your built-in, but if it's different module, then, then the different module would be able to be called, okay? So right here, let's try this one. Let's try uh, actually a uh, personal. Okay, so here I have a personal. So this personal, I do have a defined sum. 
it in the T as well. Okay. So here is one I would return T of the zero times T of the one. Let's assume that this is a function that defined in my personal. Okay. So right here, go back to my binding. Okay, go there to my uh, binding uh, a sum. Okay, go there to my sum. So here actually, if I do Uh, let's don't, don't actually take this one out. Okay, let's try a different one. So let's try from personal, okay, import star, okay, import star. If we do this way, this sum still be using the local, okay? This sum still using the local because the two namespace collide, but we do redefine it, we redefine it. We import it, we get it. But if here I cut this one, put it down here. Then here, I have a definition over here, but later I actually overwrite it. Okay, so it becomes 12, okay? So this is a so-called, what? A namespace, okay? And this one is what? Dynamic binding, okay? Dynamic binding. At the wrong time, it bind to the right location. So basically, you have a module, okay, you have a module. You do have a definition for sum over here, right? And, and if you actually merge, you do from the personal, you import a uh, star. So you merge the space, you merge the space. Here in personal, you have a definition for sum. But because you actually overwrite it locally, okay, you import it, when you import the definition for the sum already been put over here, but right here you override it. So when you call this sum, you are getting this version. But if you move your definition, protein portion to here, then this one, you get this version over here, okay? So that's the dynamic binding, okay? That's the dynamic binding and uh, very interesting. Okay, very interesting. I made some mistake, but the point is you must know about a new space and uh, from from uh, the module to impose something. That means that you are emerging the two namespace together. Okay, you are merging the two namespace together. If you are using import then it's not merging the two namespace. You are using the namespace from the other module, okay? So that's a very key idea, very important, important key idea you must remember. Okay, anyway, that's the namespace, okay? That's the namespace. So namespace actually is a module. You can also call in space a module. And each, each module, you have the local definition of each variable. Well, you can also call it reference environment. But, but reference environment, remember that you, when you merge your namespace, the binding can be different, okay? The binding, where you merge your namespace, the binding can be very, very different. It is not static binding. So your reference environment uh, when you update it is very important. So the function provide the uh, modularity. They allow to break down complex problem that require complex uh, program into small, simple self-contained pieces. It's a small pieces can be implemented, tested, debugged independently. So we really uh, in, I just suggest you uh, try not to use the merging of the namespace. Try to use the import more, okay? Because you have the habit of using the import. The namespace is not merged and you really know where the function you are talking about, okay? Objection, a function as a name should be clearly reflecting what it does. The action can then be performed by calling the function uh, by name, okay? And the call can be reused. So these are the purpose of a function. Modularity, abstraction, and call reuse, okay? Local variable hide what goes inside a function, okay? 
So here we do have some local variable x okay, in my tuple. Okay. And your I side, you have the x or y, you have outside. Okay. So when you print the first time, the outside x or y will be three and four. But you call tuple, tuple, you have the local x as two. Okay. And you have a parameter y that actually is two by two, that actually is four. Okay. You print that. And after that, you go back to your local. So your, your local, uh, your global, I'm sorry, your global, your X1, Y uh, not being changed in the XY over here, okay? Uh, one thing actually here, okay? This X is defined locally, okay? Defined locally. So you don't uh, see it as outside. So the rule is L, the rule is LEPG, your local compass. Okay, so let's try this one. Okay, let's try this one. So we do have a define of the F function with S and Y. Okay, and X equals two. Okay, Y equals Y times equals X. Okay, and then we print. Inside, okay. Okay, and outside we let's copy this one. Okay. Put it over here. Okay, outside we have S Y equals And four, okay. And here we do uh, print the outside as one. Okay, and we do double. Uh, here x is not passing, so pass in x. Pass in y. And that's actually equals one double. Okay, and the outside let's print it one more time. Okay, let's save it. So you see, only inside is two and four, okay? At least X is local available, Y is parameter available, it's also local available, so both of them are local. If you don't, if you want it to be uh, global and you have to declare it global. Okay, sometimes you call it non-local, non-local actually is not the, Function, it may have a different level of the function that define outside. Okay, that's useful non local. So that's that. That's actually is this uh, local variable. Okay, so function namespace. So here we have G function, we have F function, n equals one. Okay, n equals one, and then we print a function outside a function n, okay. You will have a definition for global friend. So global friend right here, your n is equals one, okay. And your g actually go up to g and f over here, okay. So now if you call f of n, you call f of n, you pass here, and the n equals one, and n increase. So this n increase, this one is parameter variable. So this n increase, it becomes two, okay? But the local one still, global one still be one, okay? And then you call g of n. g of n, you call a function here, okay? So you come to here, this n is a local variable on in f, so it becomes two. So here you do, uh, let's see. So lecture three, we do have the namespace number one. Okay, this one is over here, let's run it, okay. So you see the n in g actually is three, okay. And g here is in three. So right here, let me add one, some, some words over here, okay. These slides need to have some update, okay. Let me put a mark over here, okay. 
And that's that. Next one, it is called global and versus local. Okay, so every function has its own local name space. Okay, remember name space is always uh, when you call, there is also always different uh, local. So when you define a variable in certain block, it will become a local variable. Okay, and remember that uh, that time when we had the if. Uh, if you use it before it is defined, then it's not allowed, okay? Then you have to call, uh, you actually call it uh, global or non-local, okay? You have to call it global or non-local. So let's go back to look at the finding number one. So here you have to call it a global or non-local first, okay? So global, you will actually go back to here if you have a new definition, okay? So let's try finding two, okay. So here we have a define function, f function, okay. And here we have a x, okay. So here we have define, okay, g function, okay, y, okay. And here we have non local x and s increase. Yeah, here we print x. And here we do uh, what? x increase, uh, s decrease. Okay, and we do print my x. And we call g of one, okay. g of one is the one uh, completely useless. Okay, so let's put my f of x. Okay, let's put three in there, okay. And let's put, uh, let's do it. Okay, let's do it. So at this moment, we pass the x equals three over here, and we call g of one, the x will be increased by one, so here should be four. And coming back, it decreased, so you can go back to three, okay? Okay. But here, if actually we take out this uh, local, okay? And this one plus one, okay, plus equals one you don't have X definition. So this one actually is not allowed. Okay, uh, you're actually using the X over here. So if we define this one as one, that become a local variable, it's not this uh, X anymore. Uh, this one actually, you pass a three over there, okay. It define one, and this one it actually is uh, not. It actually still be this, still be this x, okay. Still be this x. So this x still be this x. So it become one. And outside, uh, let's see. I'm sorry. It actually is a local x. Local x. It print one, and the one in the f function. It is a three that you pass in. So this one is, this whole portion X is different from this X, okay. And this one decreased by one, so it becomes two later, okay. So what I want to say here is this green X and the red X are completely different variable. Okay, are completely variable. And if you want to make them the same variable, you actually right here should use non, non local. Non local means that it's not global, but it's still uh, referring to its uh, upper label uh, environment. Okay, upper label environment. Okay, anyway, uh, that actually is very complicated uh, rule for global or non-local, okay? Must be careful, pay attention to it, okay? And if you don't, don't know what it is, it would be suggested that you just try to do some experiment before you uh, use it, okay? So right here, variable with local scope. So here with A equals six, this one's local scope. So here you have return A plus B, uh, so your f function put a three in there. F of three it actually would be eighteen. Okay, 
but the outside A actually is only zero, okay. Outside A is only zero. Here we have another one. Uh, this one, you have A times B, okay. You have A times B. So we have zero, we pass F of three over there, right? So this A has no local definition. So you go back to the global definition here. And because we use a L E G B rule, L you don't find it, G don't find it, you go to the global definition. And when you do global definition, it's dynamically, it's dynamically, okay, it's dynamically. It's not by the definition. Let's try another one. This is main space number three. Let's try another one. The two is one is beautiful. Okay. So here, let's try another one. So let's call this one binding three. Okay. So here we do have the same function. Define f of b. Okay. And here we return a times b. So right here, okay, A is questionable, but we do pull into my F of three, okay, equals okay, comma F of three. And instead of putting A on top of print statement, we do define A equal here. What happens is that, okay, at this moment when we call the F of function, our A is undefined, okay? So it is undefined, okay? It's undefined. So here is dynamic scoping, uh, actually steady scoping by dynamic binding. When you buy the data, you don't get the A, you have to put it over here. Then, okay, the so-called static scoping is that it determines your scoping, okay? depending on where it is defined. So here you don't find it in your local. You go to go to see your global, that's correct. You actually do scoping, the scoping rule is by the definition of where your function is being defined. But because you cut it and put it over here, then the scoping is correct. You still see A equal zero, but when you call it, a has not been created yet. So at this moment, you will get this error. Okay. A not defined. Okay. A not defined. Okay. One more time. Okay. A not defined. So that's the, uh, so global rule, you have not the where it defined, but where it is wrong, okay? Binding is very important, it's dynamic binding. It binds to the variable that when it is actually created, okay? You have to know about its order of creation. So how Python evaluate name? When there is a duplicate use of the name, how does Python decide which one it is? Okay, so it's using the, a L E G B rule, okay. First local, then global, then build in. But if you want to use your build in version, you better import build in module, okay. That should be better. Okay. So here we have a B function, okay. F F function called B, uh, passing B into there. A equal zero, so zero will be passed over here. Uh, it actually will be used over here. So it should become zero, okay? It become zero. So you print F of print, print function, okay, let's see. A print is a built-in function, okay? Your F is here, your F function, and A, these are the global uh, reference. Function call you, call F of three, in Apple 3, you have B definition as local as 3, okay? And your global uh, environment, you do have a F and you do have a A, okay? A equals 0, so you are using the environment over here. Then the built-in, you have a print function that you can call a print function, okay? Because you don't see it in local or in 
global, then you go to the built-in, okay? So you can use the DIC, okay, dictionary, uh, DIR, okay? You can see the DIR for your attribute and dictionary also for the definition, okay? So here is one, we use DIR, okay? DIR is to find out your references, okay? DIR is to find out your references. So you can use your DIR to find out where are the module you have, okay? So let's go to here, okay? So the DIR doesn't belong to any variable. It actually is talking about current environment. So let's do print. Uh, this one doesn't work. Let me try another one. Okay, let's copy it. Let's call it by this way. Okay, let's call it by this way. Okay. So let's try this one. Okay, so here you have built in, you have cache. Yeah, different things, okay. So now if we do here, we do import person. Okay. So the environment DR, we do have a personal module being uh, included, okay. So this DR show you what are the module that you have. So the same stages. Okay, that is the DIR and module. Okay. Okay, so this function global it to have the A equals four. Okay, that's in the dictionary. So dictionary keep track of your available. Uh, okay. Lab type and storage management. So we have been talking about the name, the binding, the scope. So now let's look at the lifetime and storage management. So what we talk about lifetime is when a data being created as an object. So we use constructor to build it until it got deleted. That's the end of the object. So starting from the constructor to the end that we have delete. Okay. So during this whole time, it actually is its lifetime. <clears throat> but because of the binding, some of the variable may not be used in certain functions. So the lifetime and reference is different story. That's scoping and the binding and the naming, okay, these are different story. You may create an object, but the object may not be accessible in certain scope. So that is totally a different story. So here we are talking about a storage is where the object being stored, where the object being stored. And the lifetime is mean, it really means uh, the the existence of the object. That means that it will be available a certain scope. Okay, so lifetime and storage management, key event in memory management, including the creation of a object and the deletion of an object, and then uh, create and destruct of the binding. Okay, you can create binding and you can uh, destruct the binding, okay? And you can activate and de deactivate the binding that temporarily uh, be uh, available, okay? So that is the redirection or uh, actually uh, the, the, the assignment, okay? That may change the binding condition. And reference available to available, uh, subroutine type and so on, or of which use binding. So it including you create a object. So you may have a reference A you point into an object, okay? And later you may delete it. Later, later A may actually uh, 
pointing to a different object, okay? And that actually is a so-called the management of the memory. And this one may be deleted, may be recycled, okay? So that's the lifetime and management. So the period of time of, uh, from creation to destruction is called lifetime, okay? Called lifetime of a data, okay? And then uh, the, the lifetime of binding, we call it a scope. And the lifetime of the object means lifetime, okay? It is two are slightly different, okay? If the object outline the binding, it's a garbage, okay? So this means that you have a object and you have reference, you point into it, and then you cut the link, but the object uh, actually still existing and it is no longer pointing to it. We call it garbage, okay? We call it garbage. And then if a binding uh, outlib is uh, object, so object being deleted, but it, the reference still exists, then now we call it a dangling uh, reference. Okay, we call it dangling reference. The textual region of the program which that the binding is active is called its scope. Okay, so scope is different thing. Scope means you have A assigned with certain object. Okay, but there is a, you, you call the F function, and F function inside the F function, a uh, it's been assigned to a different object. So inside this F, it is the cross mark, not a circle, okay? But later, if you do assign it with the object again, and then uh, this, this actually is the scope of A, okay? The scope of A from here to here is actually the same, but inside F that actually is using the local rules, that's called scope. Okay, and the object lifetime actually is going to be existing all the time until it's been uh, deleted. So there is a destructor needed, okay? So memory, memory that we look at this one, okay? So we have a hello function and hello function is a program. So this program will be put into the instruction uh, section, okay? instruction segment, instruction segment. And then there's a local variable called X, okay? And you recursively call the function. So these different X being put into some area called step. We call it call frame, okay? And some variable, they may have a some variable X outside. Let's use different color. You may have global variable X, okay? Yeah. And that will be put into the uh, static variable area or <clears throat> global variable area. And this actually, this memory map is the same as the C double plus, okay? But we use it for Python, okay? Because Python is on top of C and C double plus. And we, when we create an object, okay? If we create an object and an object will be put into the heap. So the main memory location, you should have a global area, okay? And the code step and the heap, these are three major area that we store our memory, okay, our objects. And then uh, the, the global available being put into the so-called global area, and that's here, okay. And then local available usually put into code step, okay. That's these different available here, okay. And then uh, object you created by, uh, object you create by some constructor that will be uh, put into the heap. Okay, and then here we have the meta class, class and instance. So meta class is responsible for creating a class. So that's a template for a class. We call it meta class, okay. And in Java, we don't have the meta class, okay? We only have inheritance, we don't have the meta class. But in Python, we do have the meta class. So meta class is temporary for a class, we call it meta class. And then class is a temporary for instance, instance are object, okay? So in our Python system, the highest label object class is called object, okay? So AV base class, uh, derived class, they all inherit uh, from the object class. So this red one is inheritance, 
is inheritance. Okay, so your type also inherit your object. Meta inherit type. Class with meta also inherit type. Okay, and that is the inheritance relationship. Object is a top most. Okay, top most uh, object. So everybody, including this, inherit object. Okay. So now next one we have my list. Okay. So my list uh, actually <coughs> is one kind of list. So my list is an object. So it actually is this one kind of uh, one kind of the list. Okay. And this is one kind of type. Okay. And then yeah, so base is also one kind of type. Okay, so it, this one is uh, an instance of the blue one is an instance of relationship. Okay, red, red one is is a relationship. Blue one is an instance of something. So here, let's look at this one. We have an object class, point class. There is a constructor. You can put in the two variables. So we do. 0 0.00 for P and 0 0.00 for Q. So basically P is an object, okay? And Q is also an object, but P and Q by itself, they are reference variable being stored into the core frame. So this one is in the global frame. You do have one pointer class defined. You do have two object being Defined over there, and P has the value of zero zero, Q has value of zero zero. So that this one is its environment uh, data, okay? Environment data, and here we have this one. Uh, the point it has it, it need, and then it need a uh, function uh, be defined, and these are the object, okay? These are actually the point class, okay? This pointing to point class. Uh, that's the global frame. So point is a name in the global frame of this module. And there is a point class, that's the class object, class uh, object, okay? Class object, and then there are two class, a point instance. Okay, so here actually we have some software So there's a Python tutor, this one, okay, Python tutor here. Uh, this one, that's actually start visualizing your code, okay? This one is very important. So this one, let's try this one, okay? So we do have a define function, f function, okay? And we do have x, let's do x equals zero, okay? y equals zero. And outside, let's actually also have a x equals one, y equals one, and then we do call f function, and let's do print x and do print y, okay, by using this. So now let's actually do visualize the execution. So you go step by step. So it actually start to define the f function. So we have global friend define an f function, f is a function. And then we put a x equals one, and then y equals one, and then we call the f function. When we call the f function, we go to the f function, <clears throat> and then we have a variable x equals zero, and that is in the cofren of the f, cofren of the f. Okay, so this software is called Python Tutor. Okay, Python Tutor. So Python Tutor give you very good uh, visualization of your environment. And then the return value, return value is none, so it doesn't return anything. And then when we return, the call frame disappear, okay? And we continue and we print out the two value, okay? So the output is over here. Now this one is okay. We actually finish that. Let's go back, okay, let's go back. So right here, let's change, okay? How about here, I create some class. Let's use this class called point. Define underline underline init. 
okay? And here we should have cell, okay, and X and Y, okay? So here we will do cell that X equals X and cell that Y equals Y, okay? And that's, that's that, okay? And that's how about it? Let's actually create something called uh, num. Okay, so num starting to have zero, and right here we do say point the class variable num equals uh plus equals one. Okay, so let's do this, and then we do uh say point p equals point zero zero. Okay. Point Q equal point uh, zero uh, um, one one. Okay, let's do this. And here, let's do point. Okay, point the num. Okay, and right here, let's point point the num again. And here, let's do point point the num one more time. So we do this similar to the example on the slides. Let's visualize it. Okay, so here we start to uh, run. So we have a global friend. In the global friend, we do have an ini function. Okay, and that's a point class. So point class is the template of the point. That's a class object and class object being created. Okay, with this, it has an ini function and the class variable, uh, I'm sorry, there's a steady variable, num equal zero, okay. Uh, then next one, next one, we do print it, it print zero, there's no point, okay, at this moment. And we actually create a point P, and point P uh, using the init, okay, and you create a point P and it uh, will, uh, right here, this three, these three are in the global frame. Global frame, it called it init and with this different value. So that's go. Where it come to run the init function and then create the X. So this X and Y, these two blue one are the parameters one. And then the yellow one are the instance variable. So at this moment, we do call a function and the function has this different value being passed from here to here. And these are parameter in the call frame. And the call frame is inside the uh, any functions, uh, local variables. Okay. It's inside the any functions, local variables. So let's continue. So we create Y as well. And then we update the, the num, we update the num. So num become one. At this moment, we return nothing and go back. So the, fun, the, the, the constructor finish, and we have one reference pointer P pointing to the object here, okay? One more, we create another one called Q, so it will call the constructor of the point class. So we call the constructor of the point class, and we pass one one to it, okay? And then we will uh, start to create another instance that's called Q instance, and you create the value one one, and then the number of the uh, point increase to two, and then after that we return and create a Q point, and we print out the number of the point by one. So this show us how the object being constructed, and during the construction of these different object, what will be the variables? Okay, good. Let's continue. That's actually the idea of the creation of object, okay? So once the object being created, and then uh, once the object being created, then the object exists. That's the lifetime of the object. Okay, that's the lifetime of the object. And the content of stack, stack is storing the local variable. So you store the argument and the return of the variable, local variable temporary and the bookkeeping, the registers, okay? And local variable including the local variable and arguments, okay? And it is, has a offset from your call friend. So your call friend has a frame pointer and your, your local variable would have a offset value stored with respect to the frame pointer, because this same function may be called many times. So every time there's a, 
uh, observed value being calculated. And it will be stored like this. Your A function call B function, okay? And then you call the B function one more time. And then you call C function, okay? So and C then we have D. So these are procedure. Procedure C have D and E, okay? B uh, actually have uh, C, okay? If B then C. Uh, we will run B and then run C. Okay, so procedure A, the main problem run procedure A and A call B. A call A call B and B procedure will call B and then call C. So this is a recursive call and then we call C, okay? And then in C, we actually part of, pass the parameter over there, okay? So that is the corporate, okay? That's the corporate uh, in a step. And call plan in the stack, actually, usually you have a frame pointer and your offset is calculated based on your frame pointer. So right here, you need to know about call frame, frame pointer activation record. Activation record is this call frame, we call it, also call it activation record. It's two on the set, okay? And calling sequence is, uh, you have a prologue and epilogue, okay? Prologue is the preparation to enter into a function. Epilogue is when you get out of a function, that's called epilogue. So maintenance of stack is responsible for calling sequences mm -hmm. and subtin, prologue and epilogue. So prologue is the preparation of the uh, calling, okay? So we can say that you try to call a function, Say so that's time when we uh, look at this one. When you call the function, that's actually restart, okay? So get started. When we call this ED function, uh, preparation of the data and before you really go into the function, this preparation of the data, we can call it uh, the so-called prolog, okay? And we keep going, keep going, keep going, and then we'll try to return something. The return of something and assign the value back to the main program. That's called epilog. This portion is called epilog. So prolog is responsible for preparation of the windows, uh, window of the registers and the, the environment so that your program can jump from your main program to sub program. That's called prolog. And the procedure to clean up the memory in, and call frame and then return to your main function that's called epilog. Okay. So space is saved by putting as much in prolog and the epilog as possible. So we try to put more things into prolog and epilog instead of putting to the frame and the main functions global frame. Okay. And heap is for dynamic memory allocation. Okay, heap is for that many, like our object, okay, our point, they will be stored in heap, okay. The object is actually stored in heap. And heap, because of the allocation, you have constructor, destructor, and also memory allocate, free and heap. These are C language, C double plus language is a terminology, okay. And you have fragmentation issue, some of the memory being allocated, some of them are not used, so they may have fragmentation. And when you find a new space for a object, you may have the first, first fit algorithm or best fit algorithm. Okay, that depends. And some object that has nobody to refer to, uh, that's called and garbage. So our system may work on the garbage collection, okay? Uh, especially for Java virtual machine, they have such uh, object, uh, the garbage collection, and we call it mark and sweep algorithm. You go through your uh, <clears throat> memory, and then you see which part is unreferenced as garbage. So we mark, and next time we clean it, it's called mark and sweep algorithm. Okay, mark and sweep algorithm. Okay, that's the lifetime that time and the memory management, okay? And scope rule, uh, we talk about scope rule. So here so far, we learned about a few terminology, okay? We learned about uh, the name of available, okay, that's A, 
and then binding of the variable, okay, that actually when A bind to certain memory location, and this memory location can be in your heap, can be you in your stack, can be in your global area, okay, these are different location you may have. And then you have scope issue, scope is talking about uh, which version of the A you should use, Okay, which version of the A you should use, that's called scope. Okay, so name binding scope. And we also have lifetime. So lifetime is talking about when A gets started until A being terminated. This whole time is called lifetime. In the middle, some part of it may not be referenced. Okay, so that's called lifetime. And so here we do have a few things we need to know. One is binding. One is typing. One is scoping, okay. So type, let's talk about type. Uh, because Python is, don't have type, don't have type declaration. So the typing system, we know it, it actually is dynamic, dynamic uh, type. So at the wrong time, we determine a reference variable, what type of the data it is, okay? And the binding, binding actually, and scoping, scoping, it is static. So when we determine which part it is, we have a program, we determine which part it is, we need to see where the variable being, uh, being used, and we use that to as our rule of uh, which scope the variable is. Okay, so scoping is by the where you assign a variable. That's called scoping. Okay, and binding is dynamic. So scoping is static for Python, while binding is dynamic. Binding is binding to certain memory and the name is actually by dynamic. So these are details of. Uh, Python uh, language, okay. But I must remember the different uh, part, okay, this different uh, dynamic or static. So the textual region of the program in which binding is active is called scoping. And the most language with subroutine, we open new scope with subroutine entry, okay, in most language and including Python as well, okay, or we'll create binding of new local variable and the ATV binding of the global variable. So uh, we should say the local variable take over the uh, dual, take over the uh, binding first. So it's called L, uh, E, uh, B, G, dual, local, enclose, uh, go, uh, actually, uh, I'm sorry, G, B, okay. Global and then uh, build in, okay. Build in is the last one. Okay, so that's that. And actually dynamic scoping versus uh, static scoping. Uh, Python is static scoping. So local understanding of function behavior is easier to understand. And you know at the compile time, okay? And dynamic scoping is hard to behave, to understand the behavior and requiring to find name and binding at the wrong time. Okay, so right now very few language using dynamic scoping most language using the static scoping, okay? Scoping rule or the reference environment. The set of active binding is called a reference environment. So what is reference environment? Reference environment, in fact, is the one we see right now. This is called reference environment. The whole thing that you see here is called reference environment, okay? That's the active binding and active existence of the object, we call it a reference environment. So the completing set of the reference variables and the value, we call it reference environment, okay? That's a bigger term than the scope. Now actually it's a bigger term than the scope. It's called reference environment. The set of active binding, all of the active binding is called re current reference environment, okay? And current reference environment is changing over the time 
Okay, so the set is principally determined by static or dynamic scope rule, and Python is using static scope rule. A reference environment generally corresponding to a sequence of scope that can be examined to find current binding. Okay, it is used to find out what it is. Okay, and the so called namespace, when you merge the namespace, uh, then you may add different uh, variables into the reference environment. And that is the binding will be different. Okay, that will be the binding will be different. So let's see. So here, let me, before we get started here, okay. Okay, edit this code, let's do this. Okay, so that's actually uh, let's try this one. Okay, so we start with the from built-in import some. Okay, this one uh, here actually it doesn't allow it. Okay, it doesn't allow it. Oh, okay, this one is a known limitation. So actually, the it doesn't support this one in our uh, scene. It's okay. Let's go back. Okay, so this one is actually take it out. Okay, let's take it out. So let's do on this one. Feel in my farm. Okay. Uh, it only supports some of them, but not every single. Let's do render. Okay, let's try to do use render. Okay, use this one as example. Okay. Let's try this one. Okay, this one, we start to run this one. Okay, so in global frame, you actually merge the random integer from the, from the random module, okay? So this one, it actually, your global frame now have the random uh, integer uh, function as a from different module, but you merge the, uh, the merge the random module with current module, but only uh, merge with this random integer. So we call random integer. You do not need to use a random that in, random in, okay? So that's how this one works. Okay, next one. Okay, and then the other things actually create different point. So point is a class object, okay? We continue, but you see the global frame, it already has a random integer there, and let's go faster, okay? And now we go to here to run this random integer and it pass, uh, it actually get a variable of six, okay? So that's run in the function and then return with a six. So then you go over and become this, okay? Okay, that's the scope rule and reference environment. So your reference environment by your import, you may also get bigger and you, you do from that will merge to uh, modules uh, namespace together. Okay, that may merge two reference available uh, environment together. Okay, scope rule reference environment also can be uh, reference okay, also depends on how how we call it the binding rule. So there are two kind of binding rule. That's one deep binding and one is shallow binding. Okay, so in which the choice made. When the reference is first created, we call it deep binding. So if there are two reference and the first reference being uh, created, then we bind to it, it's called uh, deep binding. If it actually using the last one, we, 
created, we call it shadow binding, okay? Uh, this one's hard to understand, okay? Hard to understand. Uh, let's look at the scope the wall. Let's look at, wait, a deep binding, let's actually try to look at one example for this, this call, a uh, so-called shadow binding and the deep binding. So let me jump directly to here to have this subroutine environment to explain this deep binding and shadow binding, okay? And this one, I'm not going to use my own call to do it, okay? So I'm going to go back to here, okay? I'm going to do edit the call, okay? So this one, I'm going to delete everything here. I'm going to put in my uh, call here, okay? So we have, we have defined, okay, A function is I and P. Find B function, okay, this one will print I, okay. And then we have the so-called body, okay. And if I greater than one, we do P function else, okay. We do A of two and B, and we define C function, we do nothing. And then we do A of one and C, so we call it this way, okay. So now let's look at this uh, uh, function, okay. I pretty much copy this one from here, okay. So let's look at this uh, function. So here I call the A function and I pass one and C to here, so the program P is actually C function, C function just two pass. So I pass one over here. And okay, this definition of B is done here, okay? At the time we do definition of the of the I, at this moment I actually is one because this I pass to here, okay? That's the definition time. Definition time, we define it. Okay, then my i equals greater than one. I check this one and we do call p. p is a c function, so it will pass. But right now, i is equals one, so you won't do this part. You will do the second part. You will do calling a2 of b. a2 of b, actually, it is uh, going to pass two over here and the b to here. Okay, so this time actually the B is redefined again. This B is redefined again, but remember this B can be the previous B that been defined with a C function. Okay, uh, then that actually the B at that time is one. Or if the B actually is defined according to the newer I that you pass to it, then it will be two. Okay, so B whether B is a print one or two, depending on when we buy the B, the B functions I is one or two. Should it be the time you call it or should it be the time that you define it? Okay, define it. So that is, there is a rule that we need to show out. Okay, we need to show out. So right here, actually, uh, deep binding means that you will refer to uh, the first, definition of your B function, okay? First definition of, so let's visually see it, okay? So at this moment we have nothing and we define the A function. So when we define the A function, okay? We have a function A is I and P, okay? That we define it, but the body has not been constructed yet. So then we just define C, C is another function, okay? And C function do nothing. And we call A1 and C, so we call that one. So we pass one and the P, uh, P pointing to C function. And then we pass to there. And then we go into define of the B function. And B function is part of the function A. So we define P function and parents is actually F1. It's an A function, okay? Parent is A function. And at this moment, I equals one. So we finish that. And then I equals one, so we go to run A to B. We go A to B, we create I equals two and P pointing to the B function. 
and then we define B function. And B function, uh, B function uh, at that time, its parent is F2, is this F2, okay? It's F2 for B function. Okay, and now we have I greater than one, that's actually because it's two, okay? At this moment, we are in the, this frame here, okay? So, so let's do this right, we will call P function. So now this P function, is it B or is it C function? Is this B function or is this C function? Okay, so remember this P function, P function in F2, it seems to be this one, okay? So that's wrong it. Okay, so you actually, uh, you actually find the B of the F1. Okay, B of the F1, it actually go to uh, uh, in the frame one. Okay, so it's a B function defined in frame one. Okay, in frame one, parent frame one. That's the B function you get. It's not the this second one. It is this one, not this one. Okay, so this one, because you call this one is in frame one. So at that time, your frame, actually is one. So you print out one. So overall this one, it is the so-called deep binding. You bind this, this one, okay, to the frame one instead of frame two. Okay, it's called deep binding and we print now one, okay. We print now one, we did not print now two. Shadow binding is to print now two, okay. But to be exact, it would be better that you go to this uh, Python tutor to figure it out, okay? This one, I would still say is risky to uh, to run program like this, okay? To define and run some program like this. It's still very risky to do that, okay? So that's the dual of the shadow binding and the deep binding, okay? That's the dual of the shadow binding and deep binding. Shadow binding, you bind to the newest reference environment, okay? And deep binding, you bind into where you are creating, okay? And Python is deep binding, it's not shadow binding, okay? Okay, so next one is the meaning of the name within the scope. So we do have a uh, point, we do have a reference or a pointer. So pointer can point into a object. Okay, this is a C double plus language. So we use a mark. So the body, this star, sometimes I call it body. The body of my pointer is my class. So my pointer is a pointer to the my class object. Okay, so this one we call it a pointer. And my object is an object. So my object's reference ampersand that is returning the ages that would be assigned to the point, okay? And we use the body sign to access the, the object itself. So my pointer is a pointer, my object is a purpose, okay? And my object is the name of the object, okay? This, you can have a name, you can have pointer. So name usually is directly uh, referencing to the object, we call it a variable name. A pointer that indirectly calling the object, we call it a pointer, okay? And the object of a reference object uh, can be assigned to pointer, okay? And pointer can use the body operator to find the object, okay? So these are the relationship of pointer reference and the uh, name of the variable, okay? So a name is a mnemonic character string representing something, okay, something else. So X sign F, okay, program one, no, they are, these are all names, okay. And numbers and the test, these are literals, these are not names, okay. Operator can be named, okay, if they are not built-in operators. Binding is an association between two entities, the name and the memory location, or a name to a function, these are the binding. So the association of a name to its object, we call it a binding, okay? And the set of the whole binding, we call it reference environment, okay? And 
the region of the program or time interval in which program execution during which the binding is active. So the lifetime of a binding, we call it the scoping, scope of the binding, okay? And scope is the maximum region of program where no binding are destroyed, okay? So the meaning of the name within the scope, okay? We call it a name. And sometimes we can create two names to point into the same object, we call them alias, okay? And the name can refer to more than one object given at certain point, we call it overloaded, okay? So sometimes the name can, oh, like a uh, operator plus, can overload to uh, integer and 14 point operators, we call it overloaded function, okay? And, and the redefinition of a name, we call it overriding. So a parent class has a maximum function, a child class has another, that's called overriding. So alias, overloading name and uh, overriding, these are, are of different, uh, different uh, definition, okay? Overloading and overriding both are the uh, general subject of the polymorphism, okay? Aliasing. Aliasing is when we have one variable, but we have two different names. Okay. That's called an alias. Okay. That's called an alias. And you can save space. You can have multiple representation. Okay. So let's try this one, alias. So alias, let's actually go back. Okay. And actually edit the code. Let's try it again. So let's have the class. Okay. Point. Okay. So this one we, is a class to create object. So we have p equals point zero zero, okay? And then we do q equals p, okay? At this time, actually q is an alias. Try to look at it. Okay, so we create a class, okay? With the init function. And then here we create, try to create an object. So we go create an object P, then we assign P's object to Q as well. So both P and Q point into the same object. We call P and Q are alias. Okay, this is, these are alias. So that's what we call it alias. Okay, so these are alias. Overloading, overloading is when one function uh, actually operate different data type, we call it overloading. So right here, let's try overloading, okay? Let's try overloading. So overloading, let's go back to this one, okay? So here, let's do Okay, edit it. Okay, so here let's try definition. Get okay. and let's get actually we will return x. Okay, self dot x. Okay, let's have another one. Get. Okay, so that's here we have print that get, okay. So let's do printing.
โอเคคุยที่ตัวอับเจกต์และวิปลุกพิจักเกตโอเค so at this moment we have one function two function so it actually does not allow you to override okay so be careful here in Python we do not support the uh, overloading of the same function in Java we do but in Python we do not allow it okay so how to solve the problem here okay how to solve this problem over here then you have to use your wisdom to solve this problem okay so right here let's actually do this okay we, we can merge the two together okay we can merge the two together so let's actually do editing I will try to merge this program together. So this overloading is not allowed. So let's delete this one. We keep the longer b o n e Okay, we keep the longer b o n e So right here, let's actually set this one to be zero. Okay. So if actually uh, t equals zero, then okay, we can x right. And then here we uh, otherwise otherwise. Uh, we will uh, actually return here. We will have this, okay. And this one we will return y, okay. So here you will have if the non-zero t, you will return y value. Otherwise, you return your x value, okay. So this one we can achieve similar uh, functionality. Let's see. Get missing one position no perimeter. Okay, I see. Close. Okay, let's actually. Uh, here we have t equal zero. Okay, t for value equal zero. Let's actually do this one. Visualize it. Practice starting. Okay. So we start to get this one, get this one, get this one. We get this. We go back. So we go to this get. When we go to this get, here you don't assign the t. So t would be zero. So t be zero, you will actually return a zero value. And we print it with the zero here. Okay. Then we have a t equals two. And then you will bypass the first statement, and you will return the second one. Okay, it will get to. So basically, we don't allow the overloading in Python, but we do use the so-called uh, default value of the function that you can maybe the function of overloading. Okay, you can maybe the function of overloading. In Java, instead, we have different way to do it. Java to allow the overloading. So let's try Java program. Okay, here let's try one program for point that Java. Okay, so we do class. Okay. We create this, okay? And let's have a two string function. So we have public, okay, string, two string. So we can put another value, okay? So right here we do return. Uh, here we do this, okay? Okay, that is two string function. Okay, so now we want to do uh, public. Okay, get okay nothing. 
here we return uh, x, okay. And this one should return integer type, okay. Okay, so this is the same class that we read row in Python. Okay, so here we do public store. Okay. So the same functionality that we create in Python. Okay, and here we do have point. Okay. And then okay. Here we will need to use new. Okay. And after that, we do uh, actually system that how the queen that system that how the okay. so. So this one is quite different from your uh, Python program, okay? It allow the so-called overloading, okay? And in your Python, it's not allowed, okay? Okay, so remember that. Okay, that's a rule of the overloading, okay? Overloading happen in usually in C like language like uh, Java, C++, Okay, or C language, you actually overload your available, but this one is not available in Python. Okay, Python, you have to use different technique to build it overloaded. Okay, uh, because if Python, the type, there is no type, so you deal with integer and the deal with uh, floating point, or even dealing with the string. Uh, the overloading is by nature, okay? The only problem you need to deal with is overloading for multiple or flexible number of the uh, parameters. So for example, you have the maximum for two operator and maximum to, for function for three operators. You may need to write into one function, okay? That actually is different from uh, your, your uh, program. So in that case, you may set your uh, write the longest uh, possible uh, function. Okay. So in that case, what you want to do is that you will define your function to be the longest one. So here, let me try here. Okay. So if you want to write a define maximum of your own. Okay. So this one you may have uh, what you may have x, okay, equal uh, x, and then uh, y, and then you may have w equals uh, uh, actually minus nine 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 some very big negative number, okay, and actually g equals uh, minus nine 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 nine, okay, whatever. Okay, and then you try to compare the maximum for it, okay. So here, okay, actually uh, m equals x, okay. So if actually uh, y greater than x, okay. Then m equals uh, y, okay. If actually w greater than x, okay. Then m equals w, if, okay. g greater than, g greater than, M, okay, here should be M, okay, here should be M, here should be M, okay. And eventually you will be, so this one will be able to uh, calculate uh, maximum for two variable, three variable, and four variable, okay.
Okay, so we try to find mission now. Okay. So the first mission is three. Okay. Okay, then mission is four. Okay. And then the last one. Okay, seven. Okay. So just show you how you actually write the overloading function when, when your language doesn't support. Okay, this one, environment, okay. So environment is a whole set of the binding that you know, okay. The whole set of binding that you use is called environment, okay. And when you pull your uh, namespace, the environment may merge, okay. So you may have multiple environment. You have environment for higher order function. You have local name, you have function composition, you have uh, function composition, self-reference function and coding. These all affecting your environments. So the binding of reference environment, the reference environment of a statement is the collection of all the name uh, visible by the statement, okay? So it's actually changing over the time, okay? And you have a static scope rule, okay? You have dynamic scope rule, and our Python is static scope. So here we have a print select record uh, using the dynamic scoping uh, shadow binding, okay? So it is a rule, okay, this one is a rule, but because it's not related to Python, so I'm going to skip it, okay? You can study it by yourself. And shadow binding and deep binding, I already explained it. So this portion, I'm going to skip it, okay? Subroutine closure, if a language that you store subroutine as value, we call it subroutine uh, closure, okay? So closure is a subroutine that refers to a variable that defined in the encoding scope. So closure is a functions variable, okay? That's called closure. Deep binding is implemented by creating explicit uh, representation of reference environment, okay? And bind it together with the reference of the subroutine, okay? So that's called deep binding. And subroutine closure, a closure in a language with static scoping capture the current instance of every uh, subject, object, okay? A state scoping with shadow scoping is immediate. So right here, because these are not core for Python, so I'm going to skip it, okay? And deep binding by the environment at a time, the procedure passed as argument. So deep binding, by when the procedure is passed as argument. And shadow binding is binding at the time when the procedure is called. So these are the difference and that's what we see, okay? That's what we see over here in this example. So to figure this out, it's better you run the Python tutor to figure it out, okay? We don't repeat it. Uh, the same program you can find it at deep binding one, the program you can find over here, okay? And it will give you the deep binding example. So press class values and unlimited event, okay? A value in the programming language is said to be the first class status. It, it can be passed as a parameter written as a subroutine and be assigned to a variable, okay? So what this means is that if your object, your function, you can be treated as a parameter, as a subroutine, as a return value, and can be used at every situation. We call it a first class status, okay? By contrast, the sum value can only be passed as a parameter. We call it a second class, and it's in Argo uh, algorithm, Argo language, okay, Argo city, Argo city A, okay. And the surplus value cannot be passed as parameter. That's only a label that uh, actually is surplus. 
Okay, so here we do have the subroutine call for scheme and that's the first class calling, okay? So here we define plus X and lambda X, okay? And lambda Y plus X Y. So this is a definition of your uh, function lambda. And this function name is called plus X, okay? And plus X is defined by this lambda expression. Okay, by this lambda expression. And this lambda expression has an X, and this lambda expression has another inner lambda expression being defined, okay? So let's look at this. You do that, okay, right here, you do that X, F function. So F function is a function using plus two, okay? And you have a plus two, and then this plus two function is plus with a two plus two X, Okay, and this plus two function actually have a three being plus. You will evaluate with three, so y of a three being plus over there. Okay, so here let's see. You do have a a is lambda y and then s plus y. That's inner one, the real one. Okay, this is one function. Okay, so b is queen one. Okay, and plus b plus b is plus two. So the b is uh, using the lambda function. So your two plus two, lambda two is a, and then a uh, take another variable of a three. So y equals three, okay? And x equals two, okay? And you define the f function with x equal two and y equals three, okay? And in that situation, you will return five using this uh, this function. Okay, you return five. Okay, so object closure. So here we may have a uh, class in function. Okay, so this function it has a constructor. You pass the x to there. So this one we can pass two to there, and you call it. You pass another y to there. So this one is another plus two function that pass the X to there. So the X have been collaborated with two. And then the parameter three will be passed into to print. So you can see this integer function uh, class is exactly the same with the schemes plus X function over here. These two are exactly the same. Okay, these two are exactly the same. Okay, so lambda expression. Lambda expression, we have lambda x and the return value will be x. This is lambda expression. So lambda expression is a anonymous function that you can use to create data gate or expression of three type, okay? So the keyword is lambda. It just say it's a instant function or it is a uh, anonymous function, okay? And you have a parameter over here and the return value is after the column, it's called the return value, we call it body, okay? Body is also return value. It's called lambda expression. So right here, we can rewrite that uh, plus two function with, uh, we can rewrite a, a function. So we, we have a lambda x and it actually, uh, a x times x will return two, okay? This is called, uh, lambda function. So this one, you pass two to there, you will return S square, okay? And cube, you will actually do this. So cube of two, you get, uh, cube of two, two, you get eight, okay? Square of two, you get four, okay? So right here, we have these things, we can have a lambda function, you will return the uh, top of one. Top of one is a Y location, okay? and you will be sorting based on the y value. Okay, so this lambda one function. Multiple environment, okay? Life cycle of a function. So we can define a function and we can call it. Okay, we can call it, okay? So define function and we can call it. And then we can call in it and we call if the parameter is four, we return 16, okay? And at that time, uh, you uh, function finish, okay? So the lifetime of a function is when you call until it is done. That's the lifetime of a function. 
So we define a function, a new function has been defined, okay, name bounded to the function in the current thread. And when we call it, uh, the parameter will be created and passed to the function. And then at that time, a new frame being created, parameter bound to the arguments and body being executed in the new environment. So right here, we have a nested core of this, okay? We're square three of square three, the square of the square three. So we pass a three to here, we create a return nine and we'll call it square nine and it will be uh, 88, okay? So basically, in the, initially we have a global frame Okay, we define a function in the global frame, and then we will call square of square three, and then we go to run this one, and then we create function. Okay, we call the function x. Okay, so we call the function x, and then uh, we will evaluate the square three first. Okay, and then we will call the function square x and passes three to there, okay. And then we have a square uh, function, x equals three, okay. And we get, we run this one when we return value nine, and this value nine we pass back to here. And then we will evaluate the second square call and we'll get 81, okay, we'll get 81. So this is multiple environment. Multiple environment means that you have uh, calling a function uh, multiple times, okay. Calling maybe same function or different function, okay. Calling what different function or several function. Okay, environment for higher order functions. So higher order function is a function that actually pass function closure as parameter. Okay, that's called higher order functions. So we have summation of phi and lambda, okay? That actually is a higher order function. A function that return a function is also a higher order function, okay? And these two are both are higher order functions. So function are first class, function are value in Python. These are higher order functions, okay? So apply twice. Apply twice uh, is a function that actually, you pass a function and you will apply f function twice to x, okay? That's called a uh, higher order function. So f is a function being passed to the uh, function. So in this case, we call it a higher order function, okay? So here you will have this apply twice, okay, environment. So let's see this uh, apply twice in our uh, Python tutor, okay. So we can to define a function twice and f function with uh, x, okay. And we'll return, okay, f of f of x, okay. okay. So here we do call twice of the square of three, okay. And we print this one. So this uh, trash function is considered to be a higher order function. Okay, so we create a trace function. The trace function will have two parameters, okay. Uh, we do not have x function, uh, square function, sorry for that. Okay, so let's define a function. Okay, let's try this one. Name square is not found. Let's try it one more time, okay? It's Q-U-A-R-E, okay? 
let's get started. Okay, so we create a square function, okay. And then we define trace function, okay. And then we do twice with a function and function link to the square function, okay. And then we return this one. So we will call f function. f function is square function. And we pass a three to there. So we'll return nine. We'll return nine and then x become nine now. Okay. And you pass the x to there and you return 81. And you return and got printed. Okay. So that's our higher order function. So higher order function, you have uh, two definition, okay? One is you take a function as parameter. The other one is, is you take a function as the return value. So this one is take a function as return value. Okay, so you define a function, you return x and y, okay? And you return a g function. So you do multiply two and three. So you do multiply two that will return a g function. This g function will take a parameter y and your time with the x you have, okay? So that will give you six, okay? If that will give you six, that will return the value uh, of your uh, function. So this one is, so-called higher order function, okay? So we can create plus function, minus function, and go and do different function you can choose, okay? That's higher order function. Environment uh, for nested definition, okay? So we can mix texture. So mix texture, we uh, actually uh, pass the emoji to there and given any text, we will add an emoji there. So you can consider this one is a wrapper, okay, it's a wrapper. So you will make a texture, the heavy text, you will wrap your coming text with the symbols, okay, that's a wrapper. Okay, so that's the environment for these wrappers. So this one, let's try this one. Okay, let's try this one, let's go back to here, let's actually edit the code. So let's clear everything. So let's define a function that's called uh, make, make take. So here's the make take, we will have some uh, inner HTML, uh, uh, tag name, okay, I'm sorry. We should have a tag name. And here we can define G, okay, you take in uh, I'm sorry, this one should be, uh, let me see, it should be, uh, let me see, okay, one moment. Uh, here we should have delimiter, okay. And we should have a tag over here, okay. So this one we should return delimiter. Our G. Okay, so right here we would do uh, actually uh, taking equals make tag. Oh, uh, here we may have a delimiter. Uh, let me see. We may have a delimiter. And the delimiter closed. So this portion will be closed. This portion will be open. So we will make tag with this one and this one. Okay. And we will pull in, okay, take in. And let's see this one. 
Okay, so we make take with the two open and close uh, pattern, uh, delimiter. Okay, and we try to find a take for it. So this is currently uh, make take will return G take function. Okay, so G take function is a function, so don't worry about the take. That's not defined. Okay, I'm sorry. Actually, I have a typo. Let me let me uh, let me try again. Okay, this one actually is a typo. So let me copy the first one. Okay, let's edit the code. So this one there is no e. Okay, I have a typo. Sorry for that. Try again. Okay, try again. So actually, this g function is g with tag. Okay. And then the return value is this g function. So take in is this g function. Okay, take in this g function. And then we're trying to take in with p. Okay. So you return the p parenthesis. Uh, break it, break it. Okay. So that make it a tag for HTML. Okay, so that's what we are talking about here, okay? The make texture, the texture function. That's the texture function, okay? So we pass the higher order, we had this, we are in this texture. So environment with next data definition in a statement, every user defined function has its parent frame, okay? And the parent of a function is the frame where it is defined. Remember, we are deep binding. So the function's parameter and environment will be at its defined location. So it's called deep binding. Remember that variable you bind according to where you are defined, okay? So every local frame has a parent frame, okay? The parent of a frame is the parent of the core function, okay? An environment is a, sub, uh, a sequence of frames. So you must remember the frames. If you don't know about your frame, it's better that you use uh, your Python tutor to figure out which one you really have. So Python tutor is a good helper to figure out your frame location, okay? So when a function is defined, you get this, okay? And it will give you the parent equals label, okay? In the environment diagram. So environment diagram is very, very important, okay? So how to draw a environment diagram, okay? Uh, I think drawing environment diagram take too long. So I would suggest you just to use a Python tutor. Okay, that would be easier. But anyway, adding a local frame title with the name of the function being called, and then copy the parent of the function with local frame. Then you will know about your parent is which one, and you will define your uh, reference environment based on the parent's frame. Okay, based on the parent's frame. Local name. So here we have Thinky, SY, and Bobby, bubber y. So bubber y, you pass y value to bubble function. So bubble function, your y should be the a over here, okay? And there is a y we don't know, okay? There's a y we don't know. So at this moment, it's a local name y, this y we don't have definition. So we think he, ma and g. Uh, x is ma and g. Uh, G is uh, Y. So what will happen? I think that at this moment, okay, we keep going, we should have gone into trouble that actually your Y is unknown. Okay, so let's try this one. Sinky and uh, Bubber, okay. Okay, anyway, let's visualize it. So right here, we start to create a function for Sinky, but we do not have the uh, body yet, okay, and then we continue. We get a body bubble, okay. It was one parameter, so we do thinky, we do thinky. So you have ma and g passing to it, and you will call bar of a, and a should be passing the value of g to it. 
Uh, let me see. Oh, okay, it's actually X. Okay, so you pass the ma to it. So A pass ma to it. But this Y, we do not have Y. And there is no global definition of Y. So this one, Y is not defined. So that's what we will see, okay. But remember this, you have a local variable, but it's undefined. You don't see the Y from thinking, okay. Be careful that you don't get it. You don't get it. You must know about whether your local or your global should have a definition. Otherwise, a variable will not have the definition, okay? Okay, this one is function composition. Function composition, you are happy, you return the happy rep text. Set, you return the set rep text. Okay, you can compose. Compose, you have the X. X is the final value you will have. You will have. And you compose two function to make a new function call. Okay, another uh, eventual function you will do. So you happy set uh, this one, okay? Happy set, set happy, happy set, okay? You will get different value, okay? There's a function composer. So I use a parenthesis, okay? Happy and set, okay? And we can run this one, we get this different result, okay? So this compose function, composer function is compose two function, two, Two function, okay. Two wrapper function as a new function, okay. Composer function is compose two wrapper function to make a new function, okay. Okay, anyway. Self reference, a function can call itself, okay. Higher orders can return the function that reference its own name. So here we have print sum of n. So we'll print n, okay. And then uh, you pass the n in there and you print sum of the n plus the k. The k is a newer number you pass it. So every time you make a function with the, with the current sum, with the current sum and setting the new number. So first one we do sum, print sum of one. You return a next sum of k and you get put a three and that will actually do print sum of four. And you take another uh, K of five, your next sum will actually take print sum of uh, nine, okay? And you print sum nine, okay? So that's that, let's actually try this print sum function. Okay, let's try this print sum function. So we do have define print sum function of my n, okay. And then this one we have define, okay, next. Okay, let's actually do a k here, okay. And this one will return print sum of n plus k, okay. And here we will return uh, next of next, okay. When you return this, you will re only return the function, okay. The parameter, we don't care. So here let's actually uh, do print sum, oh, okay, here we do the print the n, okay. Print sum of one, okay. So let's try this one. Print sum of one, print sum of one and three, okay. And then print sum of one, three, and five. Okay, let's try this different one. So first one, actually, let's see. Okay, let's try it one more time, okay. So print sum, okay. We create an environment with print sum and call print sum of one. Okay, so pass it there and we will print one. Okay, and then we define a function and return n, but it's useless. Okay, and then we do print sum of one and five and three. Okay, 
So we create a print sign function with n equals one. Okay. And we print out one. And then we define the next function. And the next function would get next of the k. Okay. So we turn next. And then the next actually is next of k function in return. And we pass, we actually, we call a function. Okay. And we print some of the n. Okay. And we will actually call three and next three and print some of four. Okay. And let's continue. Okay. And the function be done. And then we do print sum of n equals one. Okay, keep calling. Okay, and then we have a k equals three. Okay, n equals four. And then we will get the five. Okay, and we, we had a print sum of uh, n plus k, okay. So eventually we get nine and print now, okay. We'll get nine and print now. Okay, get nine and print now. Okay, so that's that. Okay, this print sum, you can study, okay. Uh, this topic curving, okay. So curving is to determine partial parameters. So you make a new function with curving, okay. So we can, uh, from operator get it. So it is a function, okay. And make it n, you would use a lambda x, n plus x, okay. So lambda x plus x, you will take a value of x, okay and you return that one. So lambda is a function. So make either would be a either to with n with n. So make either two, it will be an either with two. And you pass three to there, you will become five. Okay. And current, current is converting the function taking multiple argument into a single argument higher order function. That's called current. So here we do have this one it actually is maybe multiple uh, variable function we put into this format. It's called curling, okay? So we curly of the curly two of f function with g function and we have h function and h function will return calling of f, x, y. So f is a function being passed. Uh, X is the parameter you set up. Y is the real uh, function parameter, okay? So F and X, these two are two different uh, qualifier for the function, okay? So we can curry add. So curry add, we actually, the function pass add to there, okay? And A, we make it, make either. So make either when the, uh, the G function actually is calling of the, uh, is actually this uh, add function, okay, with two. So it will become a two, okay. It will become a two function. And then the Y is the real function that you call, you pass a three to there, okay. So curly two can also be lambda F of the X with lambda y. So let's look at lambda y. Lambda y is a function that return the function and the preset variable. So you see that inner function, you can use the upper functions, uh, function uh, parameter to define the function, okay? So you can make multiple uh, level of the uh, function using using the uh, curling technique, okay. okay. This is the making adder, okay. This is the curling. 
So before we finish this chapter, let's try our function, okay? Uh, this one is called Perrin. So this curry in let's actually do define, okay, curry, okay, curry, okay, so curry, so we have a function we would like to pass, we curry it, okay. And then here we have a uh, para, the meter, okay, parameter we get uh, actually angle, okay, angle. Okay, so here we will return the parameter function. Okay, so the parameter function, we will return the parameter function. So here we do define an inner function h function. Okay, so here we have an n function. Okay, and we will return the core of f function. Uh, this parameter function, let's see. This parameter function will be uh, t should return h. So here you should return h function. Okay. So we do have n times. Uh, let's try a different way. Okay. Here that's parameter that's h2 frequency. Okay. Here we do uh, angle. Okay. So we frequency times angle, okay. we will return the h function. Okay, we'll return the h function. Uh, g function, we will return, g function will return h function. Okay, like this. And this one, we will return parameter function. Okay, something like that. It's called curling function, okay? So say curly function, you get an F, you will uh, return the parameter. A parameter will add one parameter. So basically you have curling, curling with function and the frequency, and then eventually you will add the theta there, right? So let's actually do this one, okay? Okay, let's do sine two f. Okay, sine two f will be equals curry it. Okay, curry it of f a uh, sine function. So it actually is it is sine function. Okay, so let's actually do um, numpy. Oh, uh, star, I uh, import, uh, I'm sorry. Let's do uh, import, okay, nump as np. And here we do nump as a sine function. Okay, that actually is right. And then here I do two, okay. Okay, this one create a sine to theta. Okay, create a time sine to theta, okay. So here, let's do this one, let's do, um, let's do, uh, we have sine to f, let's do uh, s equals np dot linear space. Okay. So here we do have um, minus uh, h zero to 6.28, okay. And here, let's do 101 point, okay. And let's have the y be equals, okay, a sine f of the t, okay. T in, okay, okay. And we do a uh, show. Okay. And here we need to do from pilot, okay, import. Okay. 
So this is a curling function. We make a sine 2f function. Okay, this one is actually sine, okay, 2 theta function, okay, sine 2 theta function. And then we put the x in there to make the function uh, values. Okay, so that's wrong, this one. One moment, okay. Okay, so you see this one. So it actually, is frequency of two, okay? So it's a faster, you have two period, okay? Uh, this one's two pi, okay? But your frequency is both two times, okay? So that's the function we uh, try to use COVID, okay? Okay, uh, that would be the end of this chapter three, okay? That would be the end of the chapter three, Okay, that would be the end of the chapter three. Let me know if there is any question, okay? See you, bye-bye.